a joy to uh, be here and to, to uh, minister the word. Before I commence the new series, it'd be remiss of us not to acknowledge Australia Day. This is a very special day and uh, we want to pray for our fair land. Um, right now, right across the country, I forget the figures, is it 30,000 or so men and women who have migrated to Australia are being welcomed into citizenship ceremonies uh, right across our country, uh, which is fantastic. My dad did that in 1942. Uh, he was one of the original boat people. He jumped ship in 1938, escaped. Police were after him. And uh, when there was an amnesty in 19, when the war broke out in 1939, he gave himself up and his friend was the local cop in Streaky Bay and said, Stan, you too. Uh, so he became a citizen, um, got conscripted. He was, uh, uh, but they said, either go to Papua New Guinea and fight or go to Port Lincoln and work in the abattoirs to produce food for the troops. He said, I'll, I'll go to, I'll produce food for the troops. And, uh, but anyway, my dad, um, he's a typical migrant story. So many migrants uh, want to go back to their homeland. And so um, uh, I discovered when Dad was older that he actually fell in love with an Aussie girl and, uh, but chose not to marry her. They still maintained friendship. So my sisters and I, we said, Dad, tell us all about it, please. We're thankful you married Mum. But uh, he said, look, he goes, I thought I was going back to Greece. And so I thought, oh, you know, if I get married and ma marry an Aussie girl and have kids, how are they going to acculturate back to Greece? And so a lot of migrants come and they think they're going to go back, but they come and you know what happens? They fall in love with this country and they see the opportunities. And my dad, what opportunities he had. And uh, he uh, became a loyal citizen and so uh, in love with this country. And yet, of course, respecting his homeland and he taught me the Greek language. I went to Greek school for so many years and the Greek culture, Greek food, which I've passed on to my wife and my daughters. And, and, uh, and it's wonderful to keep the traditions from where you've come from, but then to submit to the democratic way of life and the liberties that we have here in Australia. And so my dad is a typical example of somebody who uh, migrated. And you know what, all of us, this country is made up of a whole pile of migrants. The original migrants were our indigenous peoples and uh, they know they came through Indonesia, Papua New Guinea when it was linked into Australia. And for thousands of years, 200 nations plus, they had their borders, they had their languages right across this country. And uh, um, then the white man came, European settlement in 1788, and uh, it was a, an incredible success story. But within that, there was difficulties and pain that our original inhabitants experienced. And they were pushed out and, and uh, there were some not very pretty things that happened. In fact, um, the population of one million indigenous people went down to 50,000 around 1890. And most of them died through flu, common diseases that the Europeans were immunised against. And of course, that's the story of, of indigenous peoples right across the world. And, uh, and so uh, if it wasn't for the Christian missions, and uh, today it's like the Christian missions are kind of viewed as being negative, but if it wasn't for the Christian missions, they probably all would have been wiped out. Um, when I went to Hermansburg, uh, there was no doubt that the pastoralists who were taking over the, uh, uh, the West MacDonald Ranges in that area were pushing the indigenous peoples out and it was the Lutheran missionaries and what they set up there that put a halt to it, reported certain abuses to the governments and, uh, and even to this very day, those, those beautiful Aranta people acknowledged that it was those strong German Lutherans who protected them. So we're very thankful, whether it's Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, United, Anglican missions that protected our indigenous peoples and uh, today there are over half a million. They have again grown. So they are very special. Our, our country, um, in spite of its sins, reversed some terrible injustices. And uh, for those who don't remember the Mabo decision, the WIC decision of our High Court and federal government, 
uh, reversed this terrible doctrine that said the place is empty, terra nullius. So when they arrived, they said, nah, there's nobody here. There's a million people here. They didn't see fences. They didn't see governments. They didn't see, you know, standing armies like uh, the Maoris in uh, New Zealand. The British had to a treaty, the Treaty of Waitangi, to actually have some peace. But our indigenous peoples were not a unified group as such. So thankfully our governments have reversed that, you know, and uh, the, the level of care and support uh, for them is fantastic. But the British settlement brought wonderful freedoms, democracy, and uh, the, the positives of, of Western civilization and the gospel. And then the great migrations occurred after the Second World War. And that's where my dad came in just before and my mum came in in 1948. But you know, before then, there were great migrations. There were Japanese migrations in the 1800s. And if you go to Broome, Western Australia, you see a cemetery of 1,000 young Japanese boys that all died in the pearl fishing, in pearl finding industry there. Huge cemetery. Uh, you have Chinese people that came to the gold mines and, and so they, they're just Chinese Aussies. They're not just recent immigrants, they're there from the 1830s. You have uh, Afghani, Muslim Afghanis who were here from the 1850s and 60s. Why do we have a million camels in Australia? Because the Afghans came because the white fellows wanted camels to transport. So, so you've got Afghani Australians who got ochre accents but they practiced their Islamic faith and have been faithful citizens from the beginning. So what an amazing country we live in. Yeah. And uh, so we are a multi-ethnic democracy with strong Christian foundations. It's an experiment. For those who are historians and uh, uh, the, some say the jury is still out for this experiment. It's never happened in human history where you have a, a state it has many religions, many ethnic groups. Very few countries in the world have that. Australia, Canada, United States, New Zealand, a few others. Because where there is multi-ethnic and multi-religious and multicultural views, there tends to be the focusing on differences, and that's where wars and civil wars. So this is an amazing experiment, and I reckon it's worked. It's an amazing country in spite of our, of our uh, difficulties. And so um, we ought to pray for our country. Um, the very first sermon preached on Australian soil was by the Reverend Richard Johnson. And uh, he uh, was a 29-year-old, recently married, and William Wilberforce and John Newton of the Eclectic Society of the UK. These were the guys that pushed the anti-slavery brigade. And it was Wilberforce and, and Newton who wrote Amazing Grace, the Anglican minister, ex-slave trader. And they made sure that the person who came down was an evangelical, strong Christian who will preach the gospel and not just submit to the governor's wills and do the governor's orders, even though he was a magistrate as well. And, 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 so, and they wanted someone who really wanted prison reform because the prisoners that came, the 700 men and women on those ships, had already spent four months in the holes on the Thames on those ships. Can you imagine four months in those hell holes? And they used to say, don't go down there because you'll probably catch a disease and die. I mean, it was pretty bad. So uh, Richard Johnson came and uh, the very first Sunday, they came to Botany Bay in uh, January the 26th and they found that they couldn't settle there. So they, they moved around and found Sydney Cove and then they went there. Then the first Sunday when they landed, uh, Richard gave the message under a tree. Everyone came and this is the scripture that he used. Not Waymaker, not Joshua, but Psalm 116. It should be there, guys. Ha! Psalm 116, verse. This is his text. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? And basically, he's saying, it's a miracle we're here. If you know the story of the ships that came... Uh, it was rough, it was tough going through the Cape of, Cape of Good Hope across the Indian Ocean. They nearly went down. They, they, so he was really thankful. And so right from the start, he's saying, God is good and how we need to be thankful, grateful and appreciative. Uh, he was an amazing man, Johnson, uh, there for the first 12 years. Went home a little bit discouraged. I'll come back to his story in my message. 
but a wonderful man of God who laid some foundations that Australia has received the benefits of even today. So we have a uh, fantastic country that, that we have. And we did a census about 10 years ago that we had about 40 different nations represented here, people that were born overseas. I'm born in Australia, my parents, but who are actually born over, I reckon it's probably more now, maybe 60 or 70 nations that uh, uh, people have been born and come here to Australia. We are, have a fabulous country. I mean, just look at the response to the bushfire appeal. I mean, it's amazing, amazing. You go to other places across the world, the governments don't give a stuff about their people. They're more into collecting. Here we are, we've got a prime minister and government says $2 billion to start with, and there'll be more. We've got, you know, everyone's attacking these billionaires and multi-millionaires, and I'm thinking, man, Andrew Forrest is worth billions, but he's put all his money into a trust to give away, and he's giving, you know, like, so, uh, and I think th this is gratefulness, and uh, I'm, I'm so pleased that the zillionaires and the entertainers and the common people who give of their finance, and many of you have as well, uh, look at the response of care and love that's there. Um, so what an amazing country we live in. We've got a lot to be thankful to God for. Can we stand together as we pray for Australia? Loving Father, we thank you for the country you've placed us in. Lord, we think it's the greatest country in the world, but I'm sure many others also feel the same about their countries. But Lord, we're grateful. And though we're loyal citizens of this country, we are loyal to the citizenship of the kingdom of heaven that transcends national boundaries and race. And, and uh, we thank you that your church, your kingdom here on earth, the spiritual Israel of two billion people is in every nation, every people group throughout the world, spreading the kingdom message of love and justice and mercy and salvation. But Lord, we thank you that you've placed us here as you've ordained people to be in particular regions. And we thank you for this country and its history. In spite of its sins, we thank you for the spirit of forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation that's taking place. We pray, bless this land. Bless our prime minister. Bless our premiers. Bless our opposition leaders right across the country. Bless our armed services that have been serving so well in recent times. Bless our police services and all of our public servants and humanitarian groups. Bless our churches that they will spread the message of the gospel of peace and love. Thank you for every group in Australia. Those that are Christian, those that are non-Christian, those of other religions, those of other races, we pray may there be great unity in this country as we all submit to the rule of law and our democratic processes and the liberties and freedoms that you've given to us as a result of this wonderful gospel of liberty. We pray bless our country now in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. You may be seated. Waymaker, what a great series. It's uh, uh, for me to give the opening message, which we share in this Sunday every year, where we endeavour to focus a bit on who we are and where we're going. What, what's our vision? Um, our God is a waymaker. He makes ways <laughs> possible, and he wants to move yeah. with great power in and through our lives to expand his kingdom here on earth. He reveals Jesus through us, individually and collectively. He just wants to reveal Jesus to this lost world. He wants to save souls. He wants to heal bodies. He, he wants to deliver the oppressed who are oppressed in mind and in their lives and deliver them from the dark forces of the enemy. He empowers us to pursue love, justice and mercy. I tell you, he, he, God wants to, to counteract evil in our world. He wants to work against sin and sickness and evil and injustice. Uh, our CFC missions giving today, why do we give to the, educa to the education of children? It's because there's an injustice there, that they can't have a basic education. Why do we give to, to feed kids so, they, so their bodies can be strong? And, that, and it's not to say, well, it's the gospel, you know, preaching spiritual salvation, and we don't do anything regarding the social, physical dimensions. The gospel shows itself in spiritual salvation and as much as possible in, in physical salvation. God wants to counteract uh, sin and evil. That's why he reveals Jesus and salvation, 
healing, delivering us, empowering us to pursue love, justice, and, and mercy. I mean, back to Richard Johnson. Uh, when you read his story, it's interesting. I read, I read the, the book on Richard Johnson a few years ago and did a, a message. Uh, he set up the first schools in Australia. The government didn't do it. He did. He said, who's going to teach our little kids? And they were orphan kids. So he set up the first schools and, uh, and tried to get some money out of, out of the, the governors that were there. Um, he he uh, was involved in prisoner support and help. And he was there when they executed, uh, what's his name, Thomas Barrett, the, the first, a month after they landed, they, they hung a guy and had his body hanging there for two hours to warn everyone. What did he do wrong? He got hungry. He and another couple of scallywags broke into the government stores and stole some food and started eating. That was a capital offence because they didn't know whether the colony was going to survive or not. So the foods were very important until they actually planted their crops. And, um, and so Richard led him to Christ, was there with him on the scaffold, talking to him, sharing with him. So he was involved in prisoner reform. They said he was the best farmer in the colony because he was a farmer's son. So he actually got some seeds from uh, Rio de Janeiro when they dropped in there and he started planting, you know, apples and oranges and everyone loved Richard. Richard was, was so he was involved in practically uh, feeding the colony. So he was a very practical guy, but very, very spiritual. And when you read his letter, uh, his final letter when he went back in 1800, uh, 12 years, back to, it was terrific. And he had terrible governors, Governor Philip, he was the first one. I mean, was, he was a good man, but he wanted moral reform. He wanted the minister to, to just try and keep everyone obeying the law. And he didn't, he didn't really... He, wanted, he was a high Anglican man, and this guy was low. He said, no, we need to preach Jesus and lead them to Christ. And so Governor Philip was not very positive about that, but he was a good man, Philip, and uh, um, wasn't a bad man, but he just wasn't into the gospel. And he wouldn't provide money for them to build a church. And then Governor Gross, the next guy, well, he was a scumbag. I mean, he was a terrible man. And uh, he was governor for a short period. He actually opposed. And he would actually, he'd actually get to the soldiers and say, when you're in the service, get out of there after 45 minutes. He was anti-Christian. And he opposed Richard and, and wrote stuff. And, and, and again, they wouldn't, wouldn't put money in. And so what Richard did was he saved his own money and built his own church to seat 500 people. The next governor, Governor King, he was a little bit better, but he would had opposition from the authorities. The way they treated the indigenous people was terrible. And so it was Richard that actually befriended them and, and he had one of the young women come in and, be, and serve them and, and live with them. And then when his first daughter was born, uh, he named her an indigenous name. What was her name? Uh, Milba. I mean, here's a guy who is pursuing love, justice, and mercy, as well as preaching the gospel. And isn't that interesting? That's almost like he was a prophetic voice to say, all churches should do that. That's why the Christian Family Centre, what we try and do is, whether it's feeding programs or education or the kids in Sri Lanka uh, that are in those homes or uh, the Rahab ministry in, in India with uh, trying combating the sex trafficking trade and, and Cass and the DARE conference raised $8,000 or so to, to give to them. Why do we do it? Because we want to counteract evil in our world. Jesus is here to deal with sin, sickness, evil, injustice. That's what we're on about. God the Father wants to empower us so that we can reveal Jesus in all his glory, that we see salvation taking place, salvation of souls and the healing of bodies and the delivering of people who are oppressed in their minds, empowering us to pursue love, justice and mercy. He wants to enfold people into his church family as new creations in Christ. We're going to do another 40 days campaign in March. Why? Because we need to enfold all the new people in the life of the church into new life groups. We want to set up a whole stack of new life groups because being part of a church is doing life together. Yeah. It's not just Sunday services, though they're important. It's also midweek where we share and talk. I love the idea the young adults, without our permission, have been meeting midweek <laughs> during the holiday break. Yeah. They can do that anytime. They can, don't have to ask permission to love each other. They don't have to ask permission to worship. They don't have to ask permission to meet together. Oh, within reason. No, no, I'll take that back. Uh, <laughs> So um, it's important to unfold. We're new creations, but we, we're going to do life together. And he so desires us to plant new churches. And uh, we've established nine churches and five outreach groups. 
And the outreach groups are not established churches, but we've attempted many more. And they're ministering to thousands of people. I, I would estimate we're probably ministering the churches we've established. Not all of them are now part of the Christian Family Centre network of churches, but probably three and a half thousand people that we would be ministering to that have started from just a handful of young people that met in May 1976 and to see what God has done um, is it, terrific. We want to see many more leaders raised up, many more teams um, go out and to, to minister and plant churches. Look, Moses was Joshua's leader. When you read the book of Deuteronomy and then the book of Joshua, Moses was an outstanding leader, an amazing leader. In fact, he was a freak of nature when you think about it. I mean, what he was able to do, his leadership skills were amazing. You can't copy Moses. You know, Moses, David and Elijah were the three towering figures in the Old Testament. Joshua was uh, his long-term aide and he received the call to exercise faith in the same God of Moses and because he knew that God had great plans for his people to enter into the promised land that he had promised them 400 years earlier. From the time of Abraham, he says, there's going to be a land for you. From the Mediterranean to the river Euphrates. From the Negev, the river of Egypt, right through to the, to, 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 to the Lebanon territory. Huge area. Right today where you have Jordan and, and uh, Syria and Lebanon and bits of, of, uh, of Iraq right through that was to be their land that was what was promised to them but they never received it until the time of Joshua so even the great Moses couldn't get them over the river Jordan and into the promised land and so we as God's family we're called to walk by faith and to lay hold of all that he has planned for the Christian Family Centre here at Seton and all of our Christian Family Centre churches. There's a promised land for us to enter into. There's a river Jordan for us to cross. We haven't arrived. Moses was wandering around. For 40 years he led them. Then he raised up a, a, a Joshua to take them even further. And so like Joshua, God is asking us to move into 2020 dependent on him and for us to be strong and courageous through the Holy Spirit's enabling. Jesus is always on the move, guys. He's always seeking people to save. <laughs> he wants to reach the lost. And, uh, and that's why we must never deviate from our God-birthed Christian Family Center vision. And our God-called vision is that we wholeheartedly love Jesus with all of our hearts, strength, soul, mind, and to love people that are made in his image. That's what the great commandment's all about. When they asked Jesus, and said, what's the greatest commandment, Lord? They're trying to trap him. And in Matthew 22, he summarizes the whole Old Testament. He goes, guys, you want to know what Genesis 1 through to Malachi 3 is all about? It's all about the worship of God, loving God, and helping your fellow man, loving your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all your heart, strength, soul, mind, being, it's not about regulation, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship with God of dependence on him, learning to love him, to worship him. And when you are in a right relationship with him, you want to do as much good to your fellow human being as possible. You can't say I love God and hate people. The more you love God, the more you're aligned to him, the more you want to help your fellow man. That's what he said is, is the great commandment. And so we're committed to doing that. And to be an Acts 2 church for all people. The Patton Church, Acts chapter 2. And over the past 40 years plus, we have constantly aligned ourselves to the pattern we find in this first church. I wrote a book on it called The Church We Can Be. If you haven't read it, you can purchase one at the back. I'll even sign it for you. It's a great book. I think it's a great book. I get inspired when I read it as well because I'll try and put the story of what God has done over the, since May 1976. And sometimes I have to shake myself and say, did that really happen? Yeah. True? Say, wow. So if you're new to the church, you want to know where we've come from, read that. But if you notice in the book, it says, hey, that's just the foundation of where God wants to take us. There are more miracles. There are more provisions that he wants to do in and through us. The other two books are okay too as well. The me I can be and the leader I can be. So our heavenly dad doesn't want us to be complacent or timid or just self-satisfied. Yeah. 
He wants us to have a holy discontent about saying, you know what, we, we, we just want to possess that land. We want to kick out the spiritual enemies and uh, take over this land that you have promised, the blessings that are ours through Jesus Christ. And he wants us to move forward with faith in Jesus Christ who has the supreme authority and to trust his promises, his provisions, and to keep on making disciples. For Jesus said this is our foremost task, to, to, to make disciples. What's a disciple? Some people think, oh, the, the word's a lousy word, to make disciples. It's not actually accurate. It should be to make learners. The Greek word mathiti. It means to be Christ followers. So disciples tends to be, oh, to be a disciplined one. Not that I'm against being disciplined. But it's actually to be a learner. A learner of whom? From whom? From Jesus. A disciple of him. That's why we like to use the term, we are Christ followers. We're not building the church around being Bill Vasilakis followers or our congregational pastors to say, be followers of us. We're saying, be followers of Jesus Christ. Be a mathidi, be a learner. So we're wanting to raise up as many disciples, learners, learners. We're aiming to develop you to fulfill your potential and destiny to be constantly learning from Jesus and growing to full maturity and bearing lots of fruit for his glory. Jesus is stirring us to get ready, to be strong and courageous, to see his kingdom come in people's lives all around us in 2020 and beyond. Let's read Joshua chapter 1. This is a great, some verses from Joshua 1, and, and you'll see how I'm relating this to our modern era. He says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, aid, he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. He's gone, Joshua. The great leader is no longer among you. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them, to the Israelites. I, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses, as he promised Joseph, as he promised Israel, as he promised Isaac, as he promised Abraham. For 400 years, the promise was valid. But it wasn't actualized and outworked until Joshua crossed the Jordan River. Not even the great Moses was to lead them. He was 120 years old. And God said, you've fulfilled your call. Now, Joshua, it's time for you. Because I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. We have such land to conquer, church. We have just begun. We started in May 1976. I came on the scene in 1978. It's my 42nd year. I feel like we've just begun. We've planted a stack of churches. We want to plant many more. We've raised up a stack of pastors and leaders. We want to raise up more. We want to set up new ministries and, and to see people come to Christ. Hundreds, thousands. Only be strong and very courageous. Notice he says be strong and he keeps reminding him because I think he's thinking Moses is dead. He says be strong, don't fear, be courageous. Why? Because Moses ain't with you but I'm with you. I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Stick with the book. Stick with the biblical pattern he's saying. Moses has given you the law. Don't deviate from it. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Speak it. But you shall meditate on it in your heart day and night that you may observe to actually do it. Do all that was written in it. For then you, then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and be of good courage. Three times he says this. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wow. A couple of things I want to say. Firstly, human leaders change, but Jesus never changes. His nature, Jesus' nature, Jesus' character, Jesus' will never changes. And he is constant in his purposes for his church. Moses is no longer in the picture. Joshua is the new leader. And it's he, I could imagine the pressure coming on Joshua from different people. 
You're the new leader. What's the, what's the vision now? What's the vision now? We've had the vision from Moses and, and, and I have this. Oftentimes people say, well, you know, other fellow pastors, Bill, what is the Lord saying to you this year about what, what's the new vision? What's God up to? What's God doing now in heaven that he's revealing to you that he wants you now to do here on earth? And I'm thinking, hmm, that's a language I don't understand. It's like, I say, well, actually, I, I, I'm, I, it's not about my vision and what I think I'm hearing from God. I said, I'm an under-shepherd. Uh, the great shepherd and leader of the Christian Family Centre is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's actually told us what we should do in the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. He says, love God with all your heart, worship. Help as many people as possible, worship, ministry, evangelism, go out and, and, and win as many people and fold them into the families, into churches, and then disciple them, teach them, train them to obey everything. So it's all about worship, ministry, evangelism, church planting, world missions, and grafting people into local congregations, setting those up, and then maturing them and developing them. That's the vision that Jesus had for his church, and he hasn't changed his mind. So therefore, it's not a matter of saying, well, what's the new vision? It's actually going back to the old vision and getting reawakened through the Holy Spirit and saying, where am I missing it? Where am I misaligned? And help me, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, to get back in line with the, with the vision that you have for your church. Hey, I, and some people go, oh, wow. Well, you know, and, and, and they don't think I'm very spiritual. I think, well, you know, have you had a dream or a vision of where now you're going to lead the church? And so, you know, so we're going to go left and we're going to go right and some new teaching and some new emphasis. Nah, I'm not for changing because Jesus ain't for changing. I am the Lord. I change not, he says in Malachi. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. I want to be like him. I want to be like Jesus. I want to outwork his purposes. And I need fresh revelation and insight how I can better align to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Master. You see, cultic churches, and there are cultic churches, you can tell the difference between a Christian cult and a genuine Christian church because the Christian cult builds its ministry around a human leader. Okay, so they become his disciples, his followers. And that's cultic. Whereas our heart is we want to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And so... You don't want to become a disciple of, of mine. I'm going to help you and our pastors that you be disciples of Jesus. Why? Because an imperfect human being is going to let you down. And uh, I know my own sins. I know my own foibles over the years. I trust I can repent as better than, than I sin and receive forgiveness. But when staff members come on board and you know, they get invited and they've, God's called them to come up, I'll, I'll sit down and give them a little talk. So now you're going to actually get to see me up close and personal. I said, you're going to see some of my feet of clay. Up here, I'm on my best behavior. I'm really good on Sundays. You don't really see what the person is like. Talk to my wife. Talk to my kids. No, no, don't talk to my wife and kids. No, talk to my grandchildren. They think I'm God in human form. I say, hey, I say to them, you're going to see me sometimes when I'm, I'm a bit down or a bit depressed, or a bit grumpy, or um, you know, a bit unreasonable. Just, that's, that's the human condition. I said, if I sin, I said, point it out to me, and I'll, I'll repent. I said, but I said, you are serving Jesus Christ. You're not serving me. You're serving Jesus through his church. And respect the gifts that God has given to me, but realize they're gifts. Okay, the fruit but the charisma is one thing, the character is more important. Character is king. And so we, we have to, so I approach it this way. I think it's really important. Human leaders change, but Jesus never does change. Moses is no longer in the picture. Joshua is the new leader, and I'm sure that there was pressure on him to try and conform to other people's opinions and ideas of what we should do. Or maybe we should stay in Kadesh Barnea. Maybe we should go over to the land of Moab. Oh, crossing over the Jordan, there's Jericho there and there's a whole pile of, there's 13, 39 kings and seven nations and they've all got an army and we've got, to, we've got to get rid of them all. Nah, it's much easier. We've got rid of Og, you know, the, the evil king and earlier on, let's just go over there and possess the land there. That's what God really meant. 
You know, I've got a fresh revelation. The Holy Spirit spoken to me. I've got a dream. It's got to be over there. But the word came and said, no, no, no. It's that land from the borders of the Mediterranean to the Euphrates. Jesus has given us the great commandment and the great commission and the Acts 2 church. We can't change the legislation. We're the executive arm. We're to outwork the legislation of heaven that Jesus has decreed and put it in writing for us. It's a sin to go against what God himself says. And so Moses is no longer in the picture. Joshua is the new leader. And I thank Jesus. I really do. I thank the Lord more so than ever that he has raised up a group of Joshua's here at Seton and across our CFC churches. Amazing. Our Seton congregation pastors are fantastic. Nathan Betcher, I've known him from a little boy, from a child. I don't view him as a boy anymore. He's a grown-up. He's in his 40s. He's a pastor. He's going to have his PhD in ethnomusicology sometime this year. He assists me in helping oversee the CRC movement. He's a mature man. I think he's a Joshua. I see Cass as a Joshua. Amazing skills and abilities. I see a Mick Hutchfield over there. I mean, Mick's wild. Is he here? He's a wild man. It always has been. The bricky, who was the skinhead, bricky, Yorkshire. Yeah, he was unusual. <laughs> he still is wild. But to see God's raised him up to be an effective pastor, a church planter, now overseeing and having fantastic assistance in Pastor Allen and, and, and Bruce and, and others who, who are there working. I see uh, Sam Chesser. When I saw Sam first come into the church, I looked at him and I thought, something about that boy. He was only young. He was a boy. Now he's a man, a mature man. And he runs our Sunday night service and, and oversees a whole pile, a great team builder. I see that. I see the many Joshua's rising up in the church here preachers leaders all those that have gone out fantastic uh, tim lockins i was there last sunday night last sunday morning you sang me happy birthday hey thank you for that warm the cockles of my heart <laughs> and um and i was there and to see what's taken place from a handful of people from here that lived over the hill to now there's probably 200 men, women and children all together, if they all turned up. They're getting regularly 130 or so, sometimes even higher, they've had up to 180 people. Let's say averaging 100 adults and another 20, 30 kids. They've got about 60 kids and about, you know, it's just fantastic. And, um, and Tim is our Deputy Senior Minister of Christian Family Centre Churches. He's the Vice Chairman of our Board of Elders and Directors. And we're meeting again Tuesday night for the first time in the year and we're looking at expanding our board as well and having new observers come in and Tim will be leading half of that, half of that meeting along with me. And so uh, he, he's my designated Joshua that's been endorsed by the Board of Elders over now many years we've been watching that if anything happened to me, he's the man. And you've got to have that. I mean, I had major life saving surgery last August it was huge I said to the dot are there people that don't make it he goes oh some come on tell me could I die on the operating table he goes it's possible not under my watch he's very confident but you know like you don't know and you say okay what if and I had to face that and I'm thankful God has saved me and 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 he's helping me enabling me but but we've got this in place because we recognise that there are Joshua's that he's raised up and he's raising up. Amazing Joshua's. And, uh, and I'm thrilled with that. The CFC is a church, a Jesus-centred and not a man-centred church community. Guys, if we lift up Jesus in our hearts, if we memorise his words and start articulating his words, his wonderful promises and his commands, that some of them are not convenient. Some of Jesus' commands are really hard sayings and they're not very convenient. They cut us to the quick. So where the faith means obeying the commands as well as believing the promises. So as, as Moses said to Joshua, 
And as, and as God spoke to Joshua, he says, you've got to stick with the book. Don't depart from it. Lift up Jesus. If we lift up Jesus in our hearts, in our lives, make him the centre, the Holy Spirit will be our helper. But if we lift ourselves up and it's all about us, we're on our own. And, and this is the same with, with preachers and leaders. I say this to them constantly. I said it to you on, on the other Friday. On Friday, didn't I, Nikki? Yeah. Because we had Rachel Lane preach last Sunday night. Is Rachel here? She preached a cracker of a message. Dynamic. Preach Jesus lifting. You know, I, said, I just said to Nick, I said, Nick, when you're down in two weeks' time? 16. Yeah. 16. Okay, so everyone come and watch Nikki preach. And I said to him, you've got to lift up Jesus. And if you lift up Jesus, the Holy Spirit will help you. If you lift up yourself, you're on your own, mate. I mean, last Sunday, last Sunday morning, I felt like death warmed up down at, down at, I can't tell you the, the gory details, but I was really crook from Saturday through to last Tuesday. Just some after effects of treatment I'm receiving. I was really kind of like, really crook. I didn't want to be a church. And uh, so, and Kathy knows in the car I was most awkward and, uh, what's the word, uh, irritable. And uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm sitting there and my Nikki is leading the service and she just led beautifully, like Laura. She's learned from you, Laura. Oh, she's just, she led it beautifully and I'm just sitting there, whether we sang Waymaker or the songs today, and I'm saying, Lord, I feel like death warmed up. All my feelings are shot. My body is weak. I don't even want to be here, but Lord, I'm here. I've got to do it. I've got to give, I know I've got a good message and I, I need your help. And so, uh, so I get up and uh, at the end, <laughs> Tim and Nicky go, that's the best we've ever heard you preach. I said, oh, give me a break. <laughs> and, uh, but I did feel this, the, the, the presence and power and anointing of the Spirit of God. Why? Because I've really tried to lift up Jesus and give people a vision of Jesus and say, Lord, reveal him. And one of the young women accepted Christ who's been struggling in a, a fantastic conversion. She lifted her hand up and said, yes, I want to receive Jesus. And so, guys, if we lift him up in our lives and do it genuinely, you're going to get all the resources of heaven to help you. The Lord's Prayer. Remember the Lord's Prayer? We tend to focus on the second half. Give me, give me, give me, give me me. I need, I need, I need, I need. Help, 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 Jesus. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with the second half. But the first half, Jesus says, come on, guys. Align yourself to my Father. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed. Oh, your name. Hallowed be your name. I honor your name. I worship you. It's your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's actually saying... It's not about lifting up your name. It's not about extending your kingdom. It's not about you doing your will. It's actually dying to those things. And as we lift up Jesus, we're lifting up his name and saying, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done, your perfect will in heaven. Let it be our work in my life and through my life. And then when we do that, I tell you, the Holy Spirit will help us. And we're guaranteed of success. We will be prosperous and successful when we do that and so guys it's all about Jesus and the people he loves and wants to rescue and so as I conclude let me just make these statements you know we don't call ourselves Jesus calls us yes. Jesus calls us the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it he called you to salvation you can't save yourself you can't sustain your Christian life you think, oh, he saved me, now I've got to stay saved. I've got to do everything in my power. No, 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 no. He will do it through you. The resurrected Christ through the Holy Spirit living in you. So move aside and put your trust in him and let him live his life through you and you'll overcome any problem. Read the me I can be and hear the testimonies of people that have found that. And he calls us. He's called the Christian Family Centre into being. Secondly, Jesus anoints us. We don't rely upon our own talents or intelligence. Our own resources. Now, it is God who makes both of us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Jesus equips us. We look to him to speak and act through us. Look at this scripture. 
Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. Wow. You can't do his will without him, his will, his heart, and his, his spirit working in you. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. He calls us, he anoints us, he equips us, he guides us. The Bible is our guiding compass. We can't deviate from it. That's the thesis of my book, The, Me I can, the, the Church We Can Be. He said to Joshua, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. We, de- we, we move away from the book and we're on dangerous ground. If we don't accept the Bible as being the very word of God to us, read in its context, read understanding its background, the beginning of the book is really the book of Acts and the New Testament letters. That's, that's the beginning of it. That's how we're New Testament revelation. Then the Gospels look back on Jesus and what he did. And then you can understand the Old Testament. You don't start with Genesis. You actually start with the book of Acts and Paul's letters to understand what it's all about. And so the Bible is our guiding compass. And then Jesus leads us. He's our true north. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So the sign that we are the kids, God's kids, is that now the spirit of God within us, the spirit of Jesus, leads us. It's all about him. He calls, he anoints, he equips, he guides, he leads us. I want to pray for you, pray the blessing of God upon us and all of our Christian family centre churches this year, that we stick with the main game. And let him do what he wants to do in and through us to outwork the great commandment and the great commission and for us to be an Acts 2 church. Let's stand together. Let's stand. Musicians, you come as well. Brothers and sisters in Christ, friends who are here among us, he is your personal way maker and he is the way maker of our church. When he calls you to to move into new territory and he's calling some of you to move forward this year he's going to equip you for the journey he's going to provide confirmation he's going to provide miraculous provisions our CFC churches for example this year we now own property in three states here Tasmania and Alice Springs and and our other churches are looking at purchasing property that's a new dimension for them to develop their own permanent church home so we've started, so that, that's, that's new territory. I'm saying to them, guys, you've got to be moving forward in faith. It's terrorizing some of them. So do you want to buy a property? Hills Church? You've got to raise $2 million. Huh? Yes, you as the lead pastor, you as a team, you've got to inspire your people. It's going to, over a 10-year period, that's what it's going to cost. A million bucks for land, a million bucks for building. Alice Springs bought the land for 550000 Then we've got to put up a building. It's probably going to cost half a million dollars. Scary. No, it's a challenge to faith to believe that God will provide through his people. So this is the promised land they're going into. We need to pray for our our churches. (laughs) They're moving into a new dimension of operating. Wow. God birthed our church family. And he's been miraculously leading us and providing for us for over 44 years. And he will continue to move us into the future. And we rely upon his sustaining grace. And by faith, we lay hold of all he has for us. Hallelujah. There is more land to conquer, church. In his name and for his glory. I could see our four congregations becoming 14 congregations here. You say, what the heck? All I need is 14 lead pastors, congregation pastors, 14 musicians, 14 door people. We could set up a church service Tuesday morning. We could do one Wednesday night. We could do one Friday night. We could do one Saturday morning. Why not? Look at the building God's given to us. He wants it used. You think, oh, you're crazy, Bill. Yeah, I am crazy. (laughs) Crazy for Jesus. Crazy for lost people. It's not a matter of us doing it all, but to say, okay, God wants to to reach into our community. 
There are no shortcuts to spiritual breakthroughs. Walls will come down like the walls of Jericho. In our lives and in the lives of the people around us, if like Joshua, we genuinely pray dependent prayers, prayers of faith, that we trust Him and obey Him. The kingdom of God is always forcefully advancing and Jesus wants His kingdom to come to those around us as we trust Him to move through us, just as He did in the book of Acts, which is our model. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's close our eyes and pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your words to us today. I'm very conscious, Lord, you're speaking to people about them moving forward in you in this year of 2020, a new decade. Father, I pray, help us, enable us to see that you're our personal way maker. You make room you create room. You give us opportunities. You open our eyes to see. And you call us, Lord, to move into new faith territory. And I pray that you would help my brothers and sisters to see that you're going to equip them as they move forward individually. Some of them you're calling to be pastors and leaders, church planters. Others you're calling to serve you through their profession to be the best they can. To provide something positive to add value to our society. Help us, Lord. You've birthed this church into being. You've sustained us. You've provided for us. And Lord, help us to see that there's more land for us to conquer in your name and for your glory. And Lord, we know there's no shortcuts where to trust you, where to pray believing prayers, where to obey your commands, where to trust your promises, where to step out by faith as you work through us, as your kingdom advances through us. Lord, I pray. Help us here at Seton. Help all of our Christian Family Centre churches, those that are thinking of property purchases. Lord, as they might be scared and fearful and uncertain, I pray, fill them with faith and confidence that you're our provider. Lord, open up opportunities for us to reach. May our breakout ministry on Friday night see hundreds of kids reach with Christ. We pray for our congregations that we'll see them double over the next 12 months and beyond, that we'll see people flocking into the kingdom of Jesus. Raise up new leaders that we can set up even new congregations here in this home base. Help us to plant new churches. Oh, Father, new ministries to reach the poor, to reach the needy. To combat sin and sickness and evil and injustice. Help us, Lord Jesus, to reflect your heart and to, for people to see who you really are. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you that you're calling people to salvation. While we're in this attitude of prayer, before we sing a song, maybe you've never, ever said yes to Jesus Christ to be your saviour. And today, you know God is speaking to you. Just give me more light, guys. He's speaking to you. While every eye is closed, and you're saying, Bill, it's, it's time for me to settle the deal. I want to surrender to Jesus and to receive his gift of salvation. You're ready for that. Where you are, just between you and me, just lift your hand up and I'll see it. You can put it down again. Just lift your hand up high and I'll see it. Yeah, one, two, that's good. Yep. Anyone else, just lift your hand up and say, yeah, this is, this is the day. At the back, you're saying, yes, Jesus Christ, be my saviour. Touch these people, Lord as they're responding to you. Help us, Lord, all to be moving forward in you, trusting you. Amen. Let's sing this song.